All right, um, I guess it's about time here. I'm gonna go ahead and start the recording. Um, so hi, welcome to week three here, uh, unit three. Um, we'll see, I, I, I don't have, I, it might be a bit shorter than usual today. Um, I don't know if there's a whole lot, as much to discuss as maybe last time. Um, so, you know, oh, it, I mean, you know, as usual, if anybody has any questions you want as we're getting past kind of start here, you know, feel free to put them out there um, and we can um, talk about them now when we get to them. So, I mean, I'm, I'm basically planning on, um, we'll start off, we'll get the assignments from last week, um, see if anybody any questions about those. Um, and then we'll look at the uh, third assignment and um, and then maybe I'll go over the notes for a bit and see if anybody, anybody had questions about the uh, contents from our readings this week and that kind of stuff. So, um, All right. Let's um, go over the um, previous assignments from last week. Um, first of all, so I'll go over the um, the extra one that I gave for the IA assembly um, uh, example. So I mean, you know, this isn't the last time in this class that we're going to be getting. Uh, machine code or assembly code for different kind of problems and things. Um, so in this in this one, um, the, the it, it was a little bit more difficult than, than the first one because the IAS machine doesn't really have a um, addressing mode that allows you to do indirect addressing, okay? So th this, this program is a good one to keep in mind because later on we're gonna be looking at more detail of uh, instruction sets and the, uh, in particular, the different kinds of addressing modes, okay? So for the IAS machine, uh, maybe I should bring up the, uh, bring that back up again. Um, I mean, this table here, which, which was the main one, I mean, it really only has uh, one type of addressing mode, which is, you know, so, so the, the address um, um, that was in here, you know, so the opcode would have an address associated with it. So uh, for certain opcodes, the address basically represented a memory location where there was a value that, that was fetched so normally to either load it into the accumulator, right? Um, so we'll ignore the MQ here. So to, to, to like load it into the accumulator or um, to add the value at that memory address um, to the accumulator um, or do some other arithmetic operation with that address, right? Um, so in, in the later on, so we'll see that See the instructions that there, there's there's more way. These are known as addressing modes. So so the, kind of the address that the opcode works on for a um, particular um, uh, machine architecture, like this IAS machine architecture. So there's many more than this. This is like a direct memory addressing mode. So basically, the value at that address is directly used for the opcode. You know whether it's an arithmetic op operation or to load or store operation. Right. Um, so uh, two other main ones that we'll kind of run across is, uh, I mean, this, the, these bits here could be what's known as a, um, 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 a, a constant value or a direct value. So instead of interpreting this as a memory address, uh, we could just interpret this as an encoded value itself. So instead of having to access memory, you know, we, we might just put um, um, like a, a value representing uh, an integer one in here, right? So instead of having to have the constants in memory to subtract one or add one like you had to do for our programs, we, we can uh, instead use that sort of direct addressing mode instead of um, um, this uh, as, a, as an address of memory, right? 
So you interpret that just as a constant value, right? So that, that's one kind of addressing mode in here. So the other though, um, kind of leading up to this question here that, that the IAS doesn't have what are known as, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, basically as a type of indirect addressing. Um, so where the address acts as really like a pointer. So if you know what a pointer is in, in a language like C or something like that. So um, for, for, for those kinds of indirect addressing modes, the, the memory address isn't interpreted as the place you go to hold a value. The memory address is interpreted as, as holding itself another memory address. So, so then what you do is you go find that memory address and then you dereference that memory address to, to find the actual value, okay? And then further, I think I discussed this in the, um, the solution for the, um, for the supplementary assignment one here is, is um, so we'll, we'll see later on when we talk about in more detail about kinds of these, the, 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 the different sort of features that modern instruction sets have, uh, like an ARM processor or an x86 processor or something like that. So, so often with that kind of indirect addressing, there'll be uh, side effects. So different opcodes will do things like um, add one to that memory address. So that they're specifically designed to do exactly this kind of stuff that we're doing here, but we had to do it all by hand um, to, to, to like, uh, iterate through an array. So it's to step through an array of values to do something like, like we were doing, like we had to do for this um, problem to like sum up the value so we could um, find the average of them or whatever, right? So, so that, that's, that's a, a pretty common addressing mode, like, like, like x86 has instructions that will treat this as an indirect address, so basically as a pointer, um, and then we'll also have parts of the instruction that, that tell it to, you know, after you um, execute the instruction to increment that address by like one, or maybe to increment it by four or, or whatever, in order to step through an array of values correctly. So anyway, we'll talk about those things, but, but this is good, you know, keep this in mind, this, this particular supplementary problem here. We'll come back to this idea of different addressing modes here. So, um, let's get back to the problem. So, so um, um, this was difficult because we had to do the uh, kind of thing by hand. Oh, and, and um, kind of before I get into it, I mean, people did have um, basically a solution that I considered you know, it, the, 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 I mean, getting there, but, but it was pretty incomplete in that basically just hard coded, you know, so load from um, address 1000 and add, and then um, um, add address 1001, or, or, or basically, um, basic idea would be, so, so we have to have some variable to hold the sum. So, so load the sum into the accumulator and then add, add address 1000 or whatever, wherever you had the, uh, index zero of your array, and then add 1,001, add 1,002, add 1,003. So um, that is a, a basic idea, but of course that's incomplete, right? So, I mean, that would only work, um, that would only work for that particular set of four values, right? So so if, if, if you needed to, to to do the you'd have to, to write a new program if I wanted to have a different array with, with five values or six values, right? So you'd have to continue that idea. That idea. You always have to hard code that in um, to add more things. So the general thing that I was asking for was to use the IAS instruction set so that uh, if you have a, a, a value that indicates the, the, the size of the array, that, that you wouldn't have to change the code, you just have to change that value. And, and of course, uh, you'd have to get the values into your uh, your, your array um, um, so that you can use. But but basically, the, this program that I gave for the example solution, um, you shouldn't have to modify the, the only thing. So if I want to have an array of ten values and sum those up, the all, only all, all I have to do is put those ten values um, in the addresses from one thousand to one thousand nine and then have n be 10 here. And then the, the rest of the program should be the same to sum these up and get the average, right? 
So um, anyway, um, if you're interested in this particular solution, the, the, the tricky part is, is this right here. There is an instruction um, in the IAS computer that allows you to modify not the, the, the whole memory address, but to, to the, the whole location, right? So whenever you did like a store here to store the accumulator back to the sum, um, the, the, the standard store instruction would store to the whole 40 bits of that memory location. So, so it would overwrite that whole 40 bits when you did the store here, all right? So that's what this store was here. So transfer, transfer the contents of the accumulator to the memory location referenced by the address portion of the output, right? Um, So the address modify though allows you to do something subtler. So this allows you to uh, replace not the whole 40 bits, but to just replace the address field of the memory instruction, right? So whatever the 12 left rightmost bits are in the accumulator, so the 12 least significant bits are in the accumulator, those would be transferred from the accumulator to the location referenced by this, if you use this version of the store, the address modify store here. All right. Well, why you need to do that? You need to do that because what, what you want is, um, so like this address here at, at memory address 3003, um, the first time that we enter in this loop, so, so this is the same as for the first problem set, basically, um, the, the, the setup and the loop, um, the, the, the solution that um, I had kind of given you guys before as an example. Um, but when you do this, uh, so we, we initially start off that it's loading from the base address of 1,000. So 1,000 is in those 12 bits for the uh, left part of memory address 3003 here for the load. Okay, so the opcode is load, and then the 12 bits are referencing memory address 1,000 here. Okay, so then we, um, um, we load that value in. Um, and then we add in whatever the current sum is, and then we, then we store that back um, out to the sum. Okay, so, so initially the sum will be zero, so we'll add zero to five, and then we'll store the five back out um, to our sum location here, which is 2003. Now then we load into the accumulator um, uh, this value here, which is a thousand, which is the base beginning base address of the array. So that's the memory address where the array starts. All right. Um, then we add one to it. So, so we add um, this value here. So again, it would be nice if we had one of those addressing modes where we could just have a constant instead of having to put a constant out here in memory, but, but we don't have that now, yes. So, so, so we have to also have a constant out here in, in memory whenever we want to add like a constant one or something, right? So anyway, so that adds one. So the result is 1001 in the accumulator. We, we, we store that back out for the next time for the loop. So we end up with 1001 here. But then we store that 1001. So, so 1001 fits in 12 bits. Because um, remember, our memory addresses um, are 12 bits long here. and um, so, so any value between zero and um, uh, two to the 12, which is um, um, uh, 4,096, um, will fit uh, in, into the lower 12 bits here. So this stores those 12 bits, 1,001, at the address array add, um, at, at the, the left part. So at the bits eight through 19 of array add, which is, um, this value here. So basically what we're doing is we're manipulating the instruction that we're going to run um, by, by changing the address from 1000 to 1001 with the store. Here. All right. Well, I one or two people get that, but not too many. Um, but I don't know, you know, so, so um, it's something that I kind of would have thought more people would have gotten this basic idea, especially since I gave a hint 
um, when people asked about it, um, um, that you needed to use these um, uh, somehow to, to do the full implementation of this supplementary here. So, um, anyway, so sorry for jumping around, but um, but, but yeah, so, 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 so that's the trick. Um, and the rest of it then I hope should be understandable. So once you've, once you've updated that address, you're set for the next iteration through, through the loop, right? So basically we have to, um, you know, imp we have to manipulate the um, I variable that we're counting down from, you know, 43210, which is what we're using to test, to, to check whether we need to jump out of the loop or not. Um, but then we jump back to the start of our loop um, and we load that I and we test it. And then, and then again, the next time through this loop, um, when we load the value here, that's going to be actually loading the value from 1001. So it's going to load the three and it's going to then add that to our running sum. All right. Um, All right, so that, that's the trick on that. Um, and um, um, yeah, so that kind of stuff is, that, that's the reason why different types of addressing modes were introduced into uh, computer architectures, right? Um, so the IAS computer, going back to this, this will probably be the last time we'll ever talk about the IAS computer. It was one of the first, um, it, it was, um, 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 I, I believe it was the, the one that was kind of de designed by um, von Neumann. Um, so thus the von Neumann architecture uh, kind of directly comes from this IES computer, the, the um, Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, where they, they made was one of the first computers here, right? We talk about the von Neumann architecture, but, but, but this is the, basically the, the, the von, Ar von Neumann architecture, which this, this stored instruction computer here, right? But of course, many modifications or improvements have happened to it. So one of the improvements that we'll talk about is that you know that there's really only kind of one addressing mode in the original IAS. Um, so there, there's there's many different kinds of addressing modes on a modern computer, uh, mo modern architecture. X86 or an ARM. Um, so besides this kind of a direct memory address, there's indirect addressing, um, and there's constants, and um, there's there's uh, indirect addressing with um, um, auto increments and decrements for iterating through arrays and and things like that. All right. Uh, questions about that one. So a couple of people asked me to, to go over that again. Um, so. so that was the um, supplemental IS program. Um, all right, so let's see if there's any um, questions then about the actual second problem set. Um, so the first one I had maybe 10 or 15 percent of the students um, didn't actually get the calculation correct for the MIPS um, and the execution time. So um, anyway, for them, I mean, you know, so, so all three of these were directly from the textbook, uh, but of course you had to apply them correctly. But, but yeah, so except for those 10%, those most, I think most everybody else, uh, besides maybe a calculation mistake, we're mostly getting these, right? Um, mostly getting these correct here. Um, so these are the numbers I came up with um, for calculating these, the, the, the um, cycles per instruction, the total execution time and then the MIPS. Um, this is the kind of information, this is the information that we were given at the start of the problem here. So we we're given that the clock cycle was uh, 200 megahertz. So that's 200 times 10 to the six, 200 million cycles per second. 
that's our frequency. Um, the second time is just one over that. So, so you know, this tau, that's, again, I know that, that these kinds of mathematical notations using Greek letters and stuff um, can um, be off-putting to people, you know, but um, uh, at times it's, it's a barrier. You know, the mathematicians love kind of uh, um, abbreviating these things. But, um, but anyway, so that, that's kind of the standard simple for the, the cycle time, which is just the inverse of the frequency, right? So this is a measure of how long each cycle takes, basically. Um, so for 200 megahertz, uh, each, um, you know, 200 million cycles per second, each cycle takes five nan nanoseconds because five times 200 gives you the, the you know, the, the full, um, 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 One one billion uh, one one million. Um, so so um, anyway, but but you know the 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 frequency or the 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 cycle time is a fundamental property of the um, computer chip, the integrated circuit, right? So I mean, everybody knows kind of um, what sort of the modern clock frequencies are that that you're. Um, bound to run into for for general purpose CPUs, right? So, you know, frequencies, I mean, this is part of Moore's law. We, we discussed this a little bit um, last week, uh, but but yeah, I mean, the, the, the basic fundamental clock frequency that you can drive the chip at has been increasing as a function of uh, Moore's law, you know, so as, as the um, manufacturing process has shrunk um, has miniaturized the you know the the the, um, the, the basic etching the ability to etch the circuits um, that's shrunk the chip, um, and that's allowed for greater um, um, amounts of um, transistors to be put on the same area, um, and it's also allowed for you know power to to, to be reduced um, um, by Moore's law, and, and it's allowed for frequency of the, the clock frequency to increase um, basically at this rate, this doubling rate every uh, two years or so, right? So, you know, um, if you look back 10 years ago, um, um, uh, 200 megahertz or 100 megahertz might have been a pretty common um, basic clock frequency. So nowadays um, we're up to the gigahertz range. So, so um, not millions of instructions or millions of, so th this is a common thing. I, and I, I, I often sometimes incorrectly try to slip into that. So cycles, the, the, the number, number of clock cycles that you're doing per second is not directly translatable to the number of instructions per second that you can execute. So that, that's a fundamental um, misconception that, that that people can have that, 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 that don't dive deep into computer architecture like you're supposed to be learning about in this class, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, typical gigahertz, to, I mean, typical clock cycles um, um, are in the gigahertz range nowadays. So most general purpose computers, your, your desktops and laptops and, and your phones, are going to be running at one, two, three, four gigahertz. Um, although, as I talked about last time, I mean the gigahertz really have kind of stalled quite a bit. So, so we've been uh, we haven't been seeing the increase on those uh, like we're used to, right? So, so we've been more around the one, two, three gigahertz for a lot longer than it took to go from you know one megahertz to one gigahertz, right? Um, and, and, and that's, you know, I, I talked about that a little bit uh, last week, you know, we're hitting some fundamental limits on Moore's law and, and, you know, that's forcing chip designers to do lots of different things in order to keep getting performance gains in the, uh, the, the designs of the chip architectures, right? Um, Uh, anyway, um, I, look, I should move on here. So the uh, the, the two two um, different architectures that we have here, uh, the benchmark that we ran um, 
we were given that you know the, the one machine A um, only ran 18 million instructions. So 18 times 10 to the 6 is 18 million. Um, and machine B ran 24 million instructions. Um, and we were given the um, um, Well, I mean, we're given this other information. So, I mean, again, it's it's more complicated, and 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 this is, you know, something that you should understand about modern um, instructions on a computer architecture. So, um, most of the time, even on an ARM processor, the uh, instructions will take different amounts of cycles for each instruction. Um, um, usually by different classes. So, so, so kind of like in this problem, um, you know, it, it might be that, that this class of instructions is normally one instruction, one, one cycle per instruction, where this class of instruction is two, um, and so on like that, right? But, but the point is, is that, that there will be some variation, right? So, so some instructions might only take one cycle per instruction. Some instructions might take four or may, may even take more. So there's some in, in complex instruction sets, there's some instructions that, that can take even more than, than four or six or eight cycles um, to complete. Um, so that, that complicates any, um, um, analysis of like calculating instructions per second, right? Because our in instructions um, are, are taking variable numbers of cycles. So it's easy to calculate um, in, uh, cycles per second. I mean, that, that's the clock frequency. So we, we always know exactly how many clock cycles per second happen, um, but that doesn't, you know, um, just because your machine runs at, at twice as fast in terms of the clock cycles doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting twice as many instructions calculated per second. Um, you know, that, that will very much depend on the architecture, you know. So, so our, in, in general, um, uh, reduced instruction set computers and, and all this, whenever I talk about um, complex instruction set computers or reduced instruction set computers, um, you know, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. We'll, we'll talk a lot more about those um, later on, but um, in general, kind of reduced instruction set computers like uh, the ARM processor tries to have simple instructions. So, so it's ideally tries to have instructions that all only need like one cycle per instruction, right? So that, that would be the simplest. If you could make, if you could design a machine architecture where every instruction um, is simple enough that it, it executes in one um, cycle. Right. Um, but then on um, kind of the complex instruction set um, computer and um, 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 they tend, that tends not to be a goal of the design of the architecture. So, um, so you'll have lots of instructions, lot, a lot more variety of in the um, of cycles that are needed for the different kinds of instructions. All right. So um, anyway, let's 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 just um, kind of wrap that up then. So you know, if, if you understand those, then I mean, the the cycles per instruction then is a important measure because um, that that tells you um, 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 in general how many clock cycles on average how many clock cycles are needed for each instruction. Okay. Um, and, and I mean, and, and this is a, this is basically just a weighted average, okay? So it would help if you've taken courses in, in, in like statistics before to know what I mean by a weighted average. But uh, this is basically is just the um, 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 number of instructions of each type. You know, so for both of these machines, we had four categories or types of instructions. Um, and, and each one, um, machine A and machine B, had different numbers of counts of those instructions to run this benchmark, right? So by multiplying the instruction count by the cycles per instruction, and then adding up the sum of that, that, so this is a weighted sum, right? So it's the um, cycles per instruction times the um, 
an instruction count for each category or each type of instruction, right? You, you, you add that up and divide by the total instruction count, which is just the, the, the total number of instructions, and that gives you the, 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 so it's not in this, so, you know, the, the straightforward average is not really what you want here. I mean, so if you just add it up, um, if you just average the cycles per instruction, that's, um, I think I mentioned this in my notes, so that's uh, what, 10 divided by um, four. So that's 2.5 cycles per instruction. But that, um, um, that's too high because we've got a lot more instructions that only need one or two cycles than we have instructions that need four, uh, that, that need three or four um, cycles uh, here, right? Um, so, you know, the, 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 the actual weighted average, since, since, since we have 12 million of the um, 18 million instructions only need one or two cycles, is closer to two for machine learning. So, in fact, it's uh, 2.111111, I think, um, if you calculate that out. Um, and the um, cycles per instruction, the weighted average of the cycles per instruction, if you use, again, this formula directly from our textbook, um, is just exactly two for machine reading. Okay. I can use the, the, that CPI result to, to easily calculate the time, the total time then. So this is the execution time, because if you know the cycles per instruction and you know the total instruction, so the instruction time, the cycles per instruction give the total number of cycles that you have to have. And then the, the tau is the time for each cycle, right? So that should make sense if, if you understand that, right? Uh, because that that the time for each cycle, which is uh, five nanoseconds, um, and then we know the total number of cycles has to be um, the number of instructions times that weighted average of, of cycles per instruction. Okay, but even without this this uh, formula from the textbook, you should be able to calculate the total time from the information you're given from first principles, because again, you know it's two hundred megahertz. But uh, you could you could have added this up. So I know that I've got six million cycles plus twelve million cycles plus another twelve million minutes. And this is the way that some people did it instead of using the um, um, the formula from the textbook, right? And that's fine, and you get the same answer, right? So so if you multiply those up, you know you'll get the total number of cycles. And then if, if you take the total number of cycles and you do the calculation correctly, the total number of cycles times how should give you the correct execution time, right? So, um, pardon me for a second. All right, sorry about that. Um, So anyway, if I did that calculation right, this is actually the time in, in seconds, right? So, so if you multiply those out, or if you do the other method, um, you should get basically less than two tenths of a second to run all those, um, to run the benchmark on machine A, and just under a quarter of a second um, on machine B, right? So then finally, I mean, if, if you got the time correct, I mean, MIPS should be trivial because, you know, if you know the total not time and you know the um, instruction set. So MIPS is um, a measure of the number of instructions, not the number of clock cycles, right? But, but you know the instruction count. So, you know, the instruction count um, for machine A is just the sum of, of, of of these instructions, so six million plus six million plus four million plus two million, or, or eighteen million instructions, right? So for machine A, I executed eighteen million instructions in um, basically, you know, uh, two tenths of a second here. Um, 
or you know, approximately, if you multiply that times five, that would be the number of instructions in one second. So, so it's, it's pretty close to 90, right? So since it's a little bit less than 0.2, it's a little bit more than 90, a little bit more than multiplying by five. Likewise for this, so back of the envelope. So this is close to one quarter. I have, I have 24 million instructions. So if I multiply by four, um, um, I get 96. But again, it's a little bit less than a quarter. So it's a little bit more um, than 96. Then. All right. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, the general thing about all this is, um, for a graduate student, you ought to be able to be comfortable doing back of the envelope calculations like this. Okay. So, you know, you ought to be able to get to the point where you can do kind of the, 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 the things like, like I was discussing there and get a feel for, you know, when you're in the ballpark or when you're, when you're coming up with numbers that are nonsensical, right? So, so again, I had 10% of the people that, um, I mean, they were getting the execution time correct, but, but we're giving nonsensical answers for CPI and NIPs, right? So, um, All right, and then um, the second part or the first question there was to comment on the results. So, I mean, kind of a word of advice or word of warning, you know, so, so, um, so, so th th these written problem set questions are good practice for our um, comprehensive exam questions, right? So, um, on, on comprehensive exam questions for a master's level student, I mean, you know, it, it's perfectly uh, fair to ask kind of open-ended questions like this because we're really interested in you being able to demonstrate that you can, um, you know, that, that, that you can demonstrate your, you have a breadth of knowledge of the subject, um, that you understand the, the fundamentals of the question that you can produce an argument, you know, so, so you can produce facts um, and you can use those to support a conclusion, you know, um, all those kinds of things, right? So, so you know, you should, you should try and use kind of questions like this, uh, you know, our problem sets in, in a class like this um, as practice um, uh, when you're in situations like that, right? So, what I'm getting at is, is I have lots of people give me two or three sentence answers, which we're just restating the facts. So something like um, the execution time of machine A was less than machine B, but the, uh, uh, the, 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 the performance in terms of MIPS of machine B was, was more than machine A. Factually correct, but you know, that doesn't really demonstrate but you actually understand the the issues of, of why you know that, that you can kind of compare uh, these things and, and and tell me some of the deeper issues about um, the performance uh, of these two machines. So so what does that mean that that you know machine B has slightly higher MIPS than machine A? You know and and um, you know given the information that you have, right? Um, So, you know, some good things to discuss here might have been, you know, to observe things like, um, um, yes, you know, machine A executed faster than machine B on the benchmark, but, you know, I mean, is that really important? Machine A actually had a lot less instructions than machine B, right? So, so we would expect machine A to be faster than machine B, all things being equal, right? So, so the execution time might not be a very good measure of performance, right? Um, comparing MIPS um, is a more apples to apples comparison because that's telling us the number of millions of instructions per second that each machine um, executes. So it would be fair to say that the machine B has a, a slight edge because it's rated MIPS, um, millions of instructions per second, uh, was slightly higher than machine A, right? Um, 
But, um, you know, but then an even deeper answer on that would be though, and, and this I wouldn't necessarily expect you to have yet um, um, until you've kind of completely gone through like this course and the operating systems course. But um, uh, in this case, you know, MIPS can be a little bit um, also misleading because you have to ask, okay, I mean, is, is mach machine A and machine B, what's the relative power of the instructions? You know, so is one of these machines a, a reduced instruction set computer and one uh, a complex instruction set computer, right? So, so even if machine B is, is able to, have to, to execute more instructions per second, more, more you know, uh, you know to ex executing six million more instructions per second than machine B, machine A here, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's doing more work. So if each instruction on machine B is a complex instruction and each machine on machine, each instruction on machine A is a simple instruction, um, I mean, even though it can execute more instructions, um, it might not be able, you, you might need many more instructions to uh, execute the same amount of work. That's implied a little bit about because of the instruction count here, right? So uh, it wasn't said in this program, but if these benchmarks were basically trying to solve the same calculation, then we might be making a fair comparison. So, so they're both able to come up with the same answer. Uh, we, we need more instructions to, to get the same answer on B than on A, maybe presumably because this is a, um, you know, the instructions on machine B are, um, are less powerful than on machine A, right? But even so, I mean, if they were doing the same calculation, which you could argue is being implied by that we're executing the, uh, a benchmark here on these two different machines, All right? So, so you know, the, the benchmark needs more instructions for machine B than A, but they get the same calculation, the same result. So in that case, it would be fair um, if, if you make those assumptions and you gave a discussion like that, it would be fair to conclude machine B is, um, um, a better performer here, slightly, than machine A, right? So, so it's able to calculate the same. So, so even though it takes a little bit longer, um, it's, um, uh, let me take that back. So, and, and, um, and now I think about it some more, I wonder if I, if I said the wrong thing in here, but um, um, if, if that calculation for the benchmark was exactly the same, even though machine B, um, has a slightly higher MIPS than the machine A, um, and, and this is what I what I I said uh, down here in my example discussion, right? So so even though it outperformed it on MIPS, um, if you were to assume that the benchmark was to, to calculate to do the same calculation, right? Uh, in that case, you would have to conclude that machine A is actually a better performer on this task because it, it, can, it can solve the problem in slightly less time than machine B. So even though it, it's MIPS is slightly worse, um, it's performing the calculation less time. And that's really all we care about ultimately, right? So, so it, to compare apples to apples, we really need to define a problem that takes some calculation um, and then see which machine can solve that in the least amount of time. Right? But again, you know, there's there's all kind of our textbook talked about this in chapter two. There's all kinds of complications on building benchmarks. So, so the very last chapter section um, on, on on chapter two, the last section of chapter two, talked a little bit about the difficulties of benchmarking. So 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 maybe we would come to the conclusion, but maybe a better programmer could write um, a better program for machine B that could solve the program using less instructions. Um, you know, right? So, um, all right, so anyway, yeah, so that was all the, uh, all the kinds of stuff that I was talking about on the answer from problem one, anybody? Have a comment or a question about that problem?
think I have less to say about the other ones here. So um, problem two, I can't, I don't, I don't think anybody, well, I don't think anybody except for maybe one or two people um, had a miscalculation of problem two. So this was supposed to be a direct application of the Little's Law. Um, so, I mean, the only difficulty is, you know, you have to be able to correctly identify kind of from the word problem, um, what the parameters are. Uh, well, um, and, and actually we were also asking for the, um, the average um, wait time. So you do have to also, you know, manipulate this to get the average wait time. So, um, so if we have a, an arrival wait rate of 22 customers per hour, um, and if the um, the length of the queue um, or the, the the length of the um, the line here is six, so that's you know you have to recognize that that must be L um, in Little's law here. Um, the wait time is going to be the L divided by the um, um, the rate there, right? So put in two seven hours. So so some people did this slightly. A slightly different calculation. So, um, and of course, you know that that comes out to if you convert um, instead of twenty-two customers per hour, if you convert that into um, customers per minute, um, you can do the same calculation and and you know get basically, yeah. You know, so that's a little bit over, um, fifth, you know, a quarter of an hour is fifteen minutes, so that's a bit over fifteen minutes. So it comes out to sixteen minutes and some seconds. In this case, um, so um, uh, question three was. Um, not something that was directly in chapter two, but it's the same kind of, of idea. So, so calculating performance given um, um, some sort of um, um, an expression um, for that sort of um, um, system here. So here, um, I described a little bit about, about how you could derive this expression from first um, principles, right? So, so basically the idea is that, um, um, so, so think about like a fair coin. Um, the, 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 the idea is that, um, um, you know, if, if you flip a, a, fair, a fair coin two times, you, you can calculate the, the probability of like heads, you know, getting two heads. Um, so again, you know, some, some familiarity with statistics, statistics would be useful here. Um, but yeah, I mean, one quarter of the time you'll get two heads, one quarter of the time you'll get two tails, one quarter of the time you'll get a head followed by a tail, one quarter of the time you get a tail followed by a head, right? Or, or you'll get one head and one tail half of the time. You get some of that. Right? So the important thing though is that um, um, if you think of heads as um, being available for a um, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that the process is, is uh, ready to execute instead of waiting on IO. Um, so for if the IO um, um, if, 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 if P is 0.5, so if the fraction of the time it spends waiting for IO is half the time and half the time it's ready to execute, that would be with two processes. Um, um, there would be a 25% chance that um, both of them are currently waiting on IO, which is what this calcul calculation is saying. And then one minus that would, would give you the chance that at least one um, is not waiting on IO. Because um, if, 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 if one or both are not waiting on IO, then, um, what, then, then you can select one of those to run, um, and then you can keep the CPU busy in that time. Okay. So anyway, read read that off. So that's a little bit of a description of where this comes from. But but just using that relationship, um, 
if you're given, you know, the IO um, value is 0.75, and if, if you're given the, that there's 10 uh, processes, uh, so n is 10, um, you can just plug those in and figure out what the uh, CPU utilization is. And so again, these kinds of back of the envelope um, calculations are very useful for understanding the performance of computing systems. Um, so you had to do a little bit of a rearrangement for part B, um, but um, you, know, you had to figure out P given a target CPU utilization. Um, so again, most, most people most people had question three, so, um, so I'm not going to spend too much more time on this one. But yeah, you should come up with um, um, that if you have an IO ratio of 0.8577, um, that'll allow you to meet or exceed the, um, the CPU utilization. And again, I always urge you, so another kind of thing, good habit to get into is, you know, when you're doing a calculation like this, always plug it back in. Check that, check that um, you know, this is, this is a, um, uh, just a sanity check on your work, right? So, you know, so if I get this number, if I plug it back into the original equation, what do I get as my CPU utilization? So, you know, so if it's like 8.56, um, it'll, it'll be a little bit below 0 0.90, so 0.857 or so. We'll get you 0.9, or we'll get you that 9% or better, so. Oh no, the other way, yeah. So, so you need to be um, uh, that or less for your IO weight percentage to get your that CPU utilization. Um, all right, four. Um, again, I think. Most people were getting this in the work that was turned in. Um, so you had to um, directly apply the Amdahl's law from our chapter two uh, to calculate speed up. Uh, like I mentioned, we'll, we'll probably be using Amdahl's law um, a couple of times uh, in the future here. So I'll make sure they kind of understand it. Um, um, and the first one, you should have gotten a speed up of 3.125. Um, given um, a parallelizable fraction of 0.85 and n is five, so five processes that are parallel, that are uh, being used to uh, parallelize that 85% of the work. Um, and you get a speed up a bit over nine if, if you have. 0.99 for your fraction of parallelization, and you have 10. Um, and then C, you know, again, you have to um, kind of work backwards or uh, uh, manipulate algebraically Amdahl's law. Uh, if you did it correctly, which most people did, um, so we're asking um, what F value, what fraction parallelization do we need to be able to achieve? So, so, so you know, if, if, if we're going to parallelize, if we need to achieve um, um, a seven times speed up um, for our program, uh, and, it's a, and I want to rewrite it as a parallel program, like, like as, a, um, um, as a threaded application, for example, um, um, that, that's that's targeted to run on um, eight CPUs. So, so an eight core CPU threaded application. Um, what fraction of parallelization do I need to achieve in order to get that seven times speed up? And so, you know, again, if you rearrange, you should come up with about, and you need almost 98%, uh, you need to parallelize 98% of the program. Um, and yeah, I didn't show here, so, but I should have. So we should have should have plugged that back in uh, and made certain that, that if you plug in f of ninety point of, of 98 percent um, with uh, n of eight, um, what speed up you get? So you should get a seven times speed up in that case. 
Um, And then finally for problem five, um, again, kind of a word problem, but you had to, to, to realize that uh, we were back to um, applying Little's law because um, um, uh, to calculate the bottleneck, um, or well, for second part, um, um, that was Little's law. So, so you know, uh, given that, that we know the, um, the bottleneck, the bottleneck will tell us the rate. And then given that we know the rate, we can calculate the, um, um, what was asked for here, the, um, uh, the, the, the average work in product, uh, which is really the, um, the length of the QL here um, that you're asked to calculate in part B. So yeah, and then I had quite, quite a few more people were not getting this quite Correct here, or misunderstandings will apply this here. So, uh, but yeah, for, for part A, um, I guess the only tricky part is to get these into a common set of units. Um, so, in all case, uh, in, in the example here, and I think most people did it like this, they got it correct. Um, um, so a relatively easy thing to do is to convert it into unit per hour so that we can figure out the rate of each activity. Um, so if it takes 10 minutes per unit, that means that um, um, uh, we can do six units per hour. And if we have three workers, we have a total of 18 units uh, per hour. We're going to happen here, right? And likewise, you know, so if we have four minutes per unit, we can get 24 units in an hour, but we will um, or sorry, uh, 15 units in, a, in an hour. Um, but we've only got one worker, so um, we'll have a, a rate of 15 units per hour in this part of the system. Um, and with 16 uh, minutes per unit, um, yeah, I mean, if you work it out, it ends up being uh, 15 units per hour again. So, you know, divide that into uh, 60 minutes and then multiply by four, four workers then. Um, so yeah, and, and a bit of a trick question, although I kind of gave it away to the people that asked about it, but um, um, since there's two things that have the same slower rate, so, so the bottleneck is gonna be whichever Process, you know, so so each one. This, this is a serial set of tasks. So the output from activity A is used as input for activity B here. Um, so whichever one works the slowest is going to actually be a limiting factor or a bottleneck for a serial system like this, right? Um, so, but, but we've got two that kind of work at the same rate. So, so basically um, they'll be fine, but they're gonna slow down activity a bit, okay? So at 15 units per hour, um, and as our rate here, so that, that ends up being the rate that we need to use for the second part here, right? Um, and, and, and yeah, I guess another tricky thing. So you have to know that the average time is, is a function of going through the whole pipeline, right? So um, you have to add in the time to, act, to, to, to work for act, activity A to work on it, and then plus B um, plus C to get the whole unit. So, so one unit takes um, 30 minutes or half an hour to get through this system. That's basically your uh, weight. So um, anyway, yeah, I mean, if you got that right, uh, if you go back and think about it, it should kind of make intuitive sense, right? So there's seven workers. So if they're all busy at the same time, there's going to be seven uh, things waiting um, uh, I mean, some things being worked on 
currently in the system here. So that's kind of your. Um, that's your. Uh, work in progress, work in process inventory level here. Kept, uh, uh, there might be a couple, there might be some things backed up, uh, cavity A, right? So there'll be a little bit more than that. Um, since um, B and C are kind of a bottleneck for A. All right, um, that was the problem set two. Any questions on that? Um, all right, so at this point, I mean, um, um, it's a good place for a break. So um, I think I've said this before, right? So so usually uh, I like to go till well maybe a little bit shorter than this, um, but uh, go for about an hour. We'll take a five minute break, then we'll come back and um, see if there's any questions about this week's problem set, um, and then maybe go over the notes for the chapter three, the unit three stuff here. So, all right, so let's let's take um, five minutes and come back at about uh, eight twenty five. So maybe four minutes here. Steve, did somebody have a question before we get started up again here? Just go ahead and get back to it, but uh, feel free to ask questions if you have them. Um, So, um, you know, I, I thought I'd go over and see if anybody had a question about um, the problem set for this week that's due on Friday then. Um, I don't know if I have, have a lot to say about uh, the first few questions, but I thought I might jump, I might just jump right to um, the last one with the um, um, our hypothetical machine architecture questions here. Uh, well, uh, let's see. So, I mean, most, most of the questions this week um, um, are a little bit more open-ended. So um, um, these aren't going to be applying, you know, like a, um, uh, an equation or a formula like Little's Law or something like that. So they're you know, gonna ask you to kind of think about some of the stuff that um, is introduced in chapter three um, um, about, you know, machine architecture and the relationships of things like memory size and bus size and things like that. So, um, I mean, for all of these, I mean, one thing uh, we, we've discussed this before, but, um, um, you know, make certain that you understand this basic idea that um, the number of bits that you have for your address um, or for the number of bits on your bus um, um, for transferring things um, that directly affects the, um, um, like the addressable memory capacity. So, so the number of bits that you have in, in your addresses uh, directly defines your address space, right? Um, so, I mean, Computers are most most uh, general purpose computers. Your laptops or your desktop that you're using are have gone pretty much universally to be 64-bit architectures, which basically means that um, um, the addresses uh, for the instructions and things um, are all 64-bit wide, right? Um, And um, um, we talked about this 
before. I mean, I, I, I think I'd kind of thrown this up here before. So, you know, if you know the number of bits that you have, um, um, the two to that power is going to basically tell you the number of items um, or in this case, like the number of unique addresses that you could fit in those bits, right? So, um, so the, the earliest kinds of integrated circuits were, were like four bit wide and eight bit wide. So you're, you're, uh, our, our textbook gets into some of this history at different points. So like your Intel 4004 was like a four bit computer. And then the 8008 from which the 8086 um, evolved, uh, started out as an eight bit computer. Um, and then, I mean, the Intel 8086 has kind of evolved to the um, um, uh, 16 bit, 32 bit, 64 bit um, kind of route. So. Um, anyway, so I think if you keep that in mind, that'll get you through um, a, a lot of the first few questions here. So most of these are about um, a bus or memory being some, uh, some, you know, some number of bits wide, right? Um, yeah, so I think that I kind of wanted to jump to the hypothetical machine. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, um, so that's going to that's going to end up jumping us into um, chapter three, um, and then but but then maybe I'll come back and talk about some other things uh, from the notes on chapter three. If anybody wants to. Um, Um, so the purpose of chapter three is um, kind of to go back to basics and make certain that we're all on the same page in terms of the, the fundamental um, aspects of a computing system, okay? So, um, so it, so, so, so all the things that are that are kind of introduced in chapter three, like this um, uh, computer from a top level view, and, and kind of the the subsystem, the system subsystems of the computer, um, are all generic. So, so they don't represent kind of how they're named on a particular computing architecture, like an Intel or an ARM processor. So, you know, like like an Intel x86 may or may not have a, a, a register called exactly a piece uh, program counter um, or uh, an instruction register or, or these others, right? And it may have, uh, actually they have many, many others than the one shown here. These are kind of just the basics, right? But, but yeah, for any generic system, computing system, um, certainly this is a good kind of first level approximation of a breakdown of the, of the main components. You know, so you've got your processor, the central processing unit, right? And on a modern system, there's normally going to be more than one of these nowadays. So you'll often have, you might have just a single integrated circuit. So a single chip that has the, the, the um, that contains the processing units, but that chip often will have multiple processing units on it. So multiple cores, right? But so each one of those processors though, um, is a separate processor that has its own set of registers like these and so on. Um, all computing systems uh, have a main memory um, and, and, and we'll have all multiple levels of, of memory. But we'll talk much more about um, in chapters uh, four and five on, on caching and um, the memory hierarchy. But, you know, this is a kind of a good, um, mental model that everybody should have about 
what main memory looks like. Main memory is really just a big array, a big addressable array, you know, starting at index zero of locations that you can stuff in um, instructions, so, so code, or you can also stuff in uh, data value, right? So, so all the computing systems that we use nowadays are, are what are known as um, um, stored program computers, or another name for that is the von Neumann architecture computer, which you know I believe is discussed here in chapter three at different different parts. So you know one, one aspect of that. So what we mean by a stored program computer is that our memory, the main memory of the system, is used both to store instructions that are executed in a fetch execute cycle. Um, and also the data that's being operated on by instructions is in the same memory, right? So we have a single memory um, that's addressable starting at memory address zero through whatever the maximum size of the memory is, right? And each one of these addresses in memory is a fixed word size, right? So like the IAS computer, um, the, the word size was 40 bits. There's 40 bits for each one of these addresses, right? Modern computers have evolved. Uh, every all computers that I know of basically use a word size of eight bits. So every memory address um, in your typical computer holds eight bits of information, right? Which, um, kind of as an aside, you might kind of be wondering about. So how do you fit in like a modern opcode and like address? Um, into eight bits. Well, you, well, you don't. So actually, most instructions um, in x86 or ARM are 32-bit or 64-bit wide. So, so most instructions, the the opcode and the address portion and the other portions of the instruction actually fit in multiple memory locations instead of just a single um, a single word of memory. Right. So that's that's a little bit of a complication, but that's 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 the way things are done. Likewise, you know, they, data, you know, so we don't normally use eight bit data types. So eight bits is only enough to hold 256 unique values. So, so two raised to the power of eight is 256. So if I have eight bits, I can only um, specify or specific unique things, right? So that's not big enough for most like numerical processing, right? So if I want to represent an integer, I usually need like 32 bits or 64 bits for an integer. Same for like a floating point num number, a real value number, right? So again, you know, um, a, a thing to understand is that even though each word of memory is eight bits, um, tip it for, for, for many, data types, even fundamental data types like ints and floats, um, we're often using multiple words of memory, 32 bits or 64 bits or 128 bits. Um, so, so, um, so, so four words of memory or eight words of memory um, or 16 words of memory to, to represent that fundamental data type, right? But anyway, that, that's all stuff that we'll get into more, much more detail about in this class later on. So, so right now, I mean, you know, you should have a mental model though that main memory is just an array, like an array in C um, that's addressable um, and it's a zero based indexed array. So it starts at index zero. Every, every location in the array holds a single eight bits, a single word, right? Um, and and we're, we address we just address those from zero up to the maximum, right? And the maximum for a thirty-two bit memory um, is uh, is actually uh, four gigabytes because two to the power thirty-two is is four gigabytes, right? And the maximum for a sixty-four bit memory is much bigger than that, right? So it's um, 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 one of the reasons why we've universally gone over to sixty-four bit architectures. Um, is you know four gigabytes is a little bit constraining for modern programs, but 64-bit 
memory um, is quite a bit larger. So it's big enough for the foreseeable future um, as an address space for, for programs. So. Um, all right, and then IO, you know, so um, computers wouldn't be too useful if we couldn't get data in and out of them, right? So we need to have some way to get data into the main memory so that the CPU can access it and do calculations on it and stuff. So that's what IO devices are. So you got your keyboards, you got your monitors, you got your hard drives, um, you got your backup systems, tapes, and, and um, um, solid you know, uh, USB sticks and solid state drives and, and um, a myriad of things. So, so we won't spend as much time in this class talking about IO devices a little bit, but not too much. Um, I mean, one of the reasons is, is, is uh, among these four components, uh, there, there's much more variation among kind of IO devices than there is on any of these others. So, so. Um, and then you need some sort of, of component, some sort of communication medium. So some sort of interleak, interlink or um, 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 communication protocol so that you can transfer data back and forth between these three components that we talked about. Right? Um, So the first computers used a simple system bus, which is really just a kind of a, a um, fancy name for basically wires, right? So, so basically a system bus is just wires, uh, usually, you know, so, so you've got a set of wires um, um, that are for transferring data and another set of wires for uh, instructions. Uh, and then you got another set of wires on, on a typical system bus, which are control wires um, in order for negotiating um, the transfer of things between these different components. Right? Modern computers, um, the bus has evolved beyond just a simple system bus to um, these interconnects um, that are talked about uh, later on. Um, um, the the point-to-point -point interconnect and let's talk about later on in our chapter so yeah like this qpi um, is the current um, standard on intel um, and really i don't know if i'll talk more about this tonight or not but i mean really these have become sophisticated i think of these as essentially like uh, uh, um, like an internet, like, like a network protocol. So, so in many ways, these are similar. If you know how networking works, like, like Ethernet net networking with um, um, different levels of the uh, TCP IP protocol stack, uh, a similar thing is going on um, for the, the interconnect um, on a modern like Intel QPI uh, bus interconnect. So you've, you've got the same kind of idea of protocol levels, um, and data is broken down into packets to be routed across the, the physical levels and, 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 and re-put together from the packets back up um, to the protocol level to be delivered where it's, where it's needed. So. Um, All right. So anyway, um, um, I kind of jumped into chapter three instead of uh, the the um, third problem set a little bit more than I was thinking I was going to. But um, but yeah, this is leading up to talking about kind of this hypothetical machine for that last question, uh, those last problems for that last question. So besides you know the components, um, the 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 second section for our unit three here talks about. Um, um, the generic ideas of how a computer functions, all right? So um, at the most basic level, a stored instruction computer or a von Neumann architecture computer works like this. So um, it, it just basically cycles through um, a fetch execute cycle, right? 
So there's a special uh, register that holds the, called the, the program counter in um, um, our uh, generic computer components here. So that holds the address, some address in memory where the next instruction is to be fetched from. All right. So, so for the fetch cycle, we look at the program counter that, that specifies some address in memory. We, we, we fetch that value out of memory pointed by the program counter into the instruction register. And we're going to use, we're going to decode that instruction um, in the execute cycle, right? And then for the execute cycle, so once we fetch an instruction in the instruction register, um, this is conceptually, uh, or not conceptually, but um, in, in, in actuality, this is more complex. So the fetch part of the fetch execute cycle is, is relatively simple. You just dereference the program counter um, and transfer that value from memory into the instruction register. The execute cycle uh, has a lot of steps. Um, so you have to decode the uh, instruction. So, so normally instructions in a modern architecture, um, if I can um, find it here. So, so normally instructions like the IAS computer that, that we talked about, normally instructions um, are um, composed of multiple parts. So at a minimum, you've got some bits in the instruction that represent the operation, the opcode um, to be executed, you know, the, the, the actual instruction that's going to be executed. And then you've got other bits um, usually that, that contain either data or an address where you have to fetch the data from or that contain an address that is an address that you indirectly fetch data from. Um, and we'll later on see that there's there's other components in the typical um, instruction format. So, so other bits for other kinds of things. So not only the address, but the different kinds of addressing modes. Um, so information like uh, if I want to refer to a general register, um, um, you might have bits that, that mean that get the value from a register instead of from an address um, and things like that. All right, so, so, you, so part of decoding the instructions, figure out which opcode is, figuring out what the operands are. So um, those are the things that you're gonna operate on, that, that the instruction is gonna operate on. So you, so you decode the operands, um, like the memory address, maybe other operands, registers and things. Um, and then, you know, actually executing the instruction. So normally um, there, there's, a relatively large number of different types of instructions. Right? So to actually execute the instruction, you have to act, you have to um, activate the correct circuits um, on the integrated chip um, to do the operation. Right. So you have one set of circuits, you know, to do an add operation, or you would activate a different set of circuits if it was a multiply, or a different set of circuits if you were doing like a load, and so on. But yeah, after you execute that, so, so normally after you fetch, so the normal thing to do is to increment the program counter by one, because the, the normal thing for the fetch execute cycle then is that after you execute the instruction, you, you just go back and you fetch the next instruction. So by incrementing the, um, incrementing the program counter by one, um, you would, um, the, the, for the next, the next fetch cycle, you would be fetching the next instruction, right? So, so the normal thing to do is to execute instructions sequentially, one after the other, right? Um, except, you know, if all you could do is execute instructions sequentially, you wouldn't be able to make very sophisticated programs. So, you know, you've got some types of instructions that allow you to modify that the, the normal flow of control from doing sequential execution. Right? And these are what the control instructions are. Right? So, I mean, th these are basically the jump instructions, like, like the IAS jump that, that you had to use for the um, problem set one and the supplemental problem set. So, um, 
um, these jump instructions or control type instructions um, alter the sequence of execution. So in instead of um, executing the next, you know, just incrementing the program counter and executing the next instruction sequence, a jump instruction actually modifies the program counter so that you the, the net, next fetch cycle fetches from somewhere else besides you know the next sequential instruction from from doing a normal increment of the program counter. Um, right. So anyway. Um, and um, uh, we later on talk about like interrupts, right? So interrupt processing, processing is uh, important. Um, I should probably come back to that, but I, I kind of want to get talk about the hypothet hypothetical machine um, and the uh, the last question here for so the uh, problem set three a little bit. So th this is enough in order to understand the hypothetical machine um, that was given um, in chapter three here. So we've got different types of instructions, um, you know, so, so things like load and store are examples, uh, processor memory instructions. So, so, so some of the simplest types of instructions simply transfer memory back and forth from, uh, transfer data back and forth from the CPU to memory, right? So that, that's what your basic kind of load and store is. Right? Um, and in some machine architectures, you might have special instructions um, that transfer data back and forth instead of from to and from the CPU to memory, transfer it back and forth uh, from the CPU to a, a IO device or transfer it back and forth from uh, an IO device to memory, right? But, but yeah, usually from processor to an IO device. Um, but some architectures, you don't really have special instructions for this. Um, you just um, use uh, memory mapped I.O. So by loading or, or storing from special addresses in memory, those actually end up accessing I.O. devices. They get mapped to um, walls to transfer data to or from I.O. devices. Besides loads and stores, um, your other kind of main category um, are data processing, so those are really just arithmetic or logic operations. So um, add, subtract, multiply, divide for arithmetic, but also Boolean operations. So um, less than, greater than, um, equal to, um, um, and also like Boolean um, manipulation. So you might do a Boolean and, so, so bitwise ands, uh, uh, bitwise ors, um, shifting, so you might shift values left or right, those kinds of things are, are all data processing instructions. Yeah, and, and in the, uh, the textbook, he only gave you like three instructions um, that were used in this example. So I kind of expanded this a little bit for the um, assignment three. So, um, Besides the add, load, and store, I added in a subtract instruction. Um, so that's using binary opcode 0100. Um, also, like some jump instructions. So a jump, an absolute jump, a jump um, if the result is zero. So if the accumulator is zero, do a, a jump. But if it's not zero, don't do a jump. So a conditional jump or a jump on negative. So if the accumulator is negative, do a uh, jump. And if it's positive or zero, don't do a job. All right, so those were added in. So, um, but um, so, so I expect you. So, so all this one thing to understand is that all these values here and in your assignment, these are all um, given in hexadecimal. All right. So these are all four digit hexadecimal and each hexadecimal digit represents uh, four bits. Um, as you can know from our unit one where we did the translation from like binary hexadecimal. Kind of thing, right? 
So anyway, I mean, that should be enough a hint of, of a hint to know how to translate, you know, the values given here uh, and figure out what the opcode is. So the first four bits are the opcode and then the next 12 bits are an address um, in this um, hypothetical machine architecture here, right? Oh, and by the way, um, our hypothetical machine is actually using 16-bit words. So every word of memory holds 16 bits instead of eight bits. So again, that's that's different. So it's less than the IAS, but um, this is more bits than um, the actual word that most computers, um, modern computers actually use, that, that use eight bit words instead of 16 bit words. Um, all right, so, and then one final thing to know, um, so we're only doing arithmetic operations um, on integer numbers, so we don't use floating point representations. That's another, another thing we'll talk about. We'll talk about representing numbers, um, so basic types in a computing system later on, but, but right now we're using a simple signed format. So we use one bit to represent the sign, so if it's zero, um, then it's a positive number. And if it's one, then it's a negative number. And then the other 15 bits represent the magnitude, right? Um, and by the way, so that, that means that the, what, what, are the valid value, what are the valid values or that could be represented in this format that we just defined here? Or I guess I should say, what's the range of valid values, right? So if we have 15 bits, um, that means that we can have uh, two to the 15, two to the power of 15. So that, that has a maximum of, um, so, so two to the 10 is 1,024. Um, and then, you know, each, each additional bit multiplies that by two. So 2,048 for 11, two to the 11, two to the 12 is 4,096. Two to the 13 is um, 8,100. Ninety-two to the fourteen is sixteen thousand. Um, got to get my calculator out. Was that two hundred uh, three hundred eighty-four? I think that's right. And then 50, this is basically 32K or, or 32,000, um, um, seven, sixty-five. Don't hold me to those calculations. So approximately 32,000, right? 32K is, is, is 15, yeah. right? So anyway, um, so that means that uh, we can represent numbers up to positive 32,000 something. Right. Uh, if we have the sign bit be zero in our integer format, uh, down to we get, we have numbers down to negative of that. So um, if if we have a one at the sign bit and all the, the values are um, and, and all the bits are one in the magnitude, then it would be negative thirty two thousand whatever seven sixty eight. I bet not seven sixty five, but seven sixty eight. And any value in between. Right. But um, but uh, make certain that when you're doing the um, these problems for the assignment three, I mean, show all your results in hexadecimal. Okay, so so whatever value that you get. Uh, make certain that you show the result in hexadecimal. So don't give me the binary. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm make sure you, that, you, that you translate it um, into the hexadecimal result. Okay. And make certain that you correctly represent positive and negative numbers, right? So some of the calculations I believe that I gave you 
Um, are going to be doing some things with numbers that are negatives. So, um, so I, I, I think so. So, so um, you know, watch out for that, right? So again, you know, make sure. So, for example, you know, I don't know if if anybody wants to. Um, um, so there is a question for you, kind of a, a quick quiz. So, so how would you represent? Um, I mean, zero is just all zero bits. And actually, there's two ways to represent zero for a sign magnitude number here. So you could have a negative zero and a positive zero, which is something, again, we'll talk about later on. So you could have a one with all zeros, that would be a negative zero, or a zero bit for the sign bit with all zeros, or um, a positive zero. So a positive one would just be a zero with you know all zero and then a one bit at the end, right? Um, but how would you represent negative one? And then you know so so you, I mean you ought to be able to trivially figure out how to represent negative one for the binary for, for the um, the binary digits here, right? You just need a one for the sign bit, but what does that um, actually uh, translate to in hexadecimal. So, so what's the hexadecimal for negative one um, using this sign magnitude format here? Anybody want to answer that? So, so this, this will be helpful to make certain that you get the negative numbers right that you have to do for the um, um, assignment three question. I want to hazard a guess. So, so what's negative one um, in this hypothetical, this hypothetical machine format here uh, in hexadecimal? Again, the binary is, you know, we've got 16 bits for our integer format. So, I mean, that's basically our binary for negative one, because we use one for the sign bit, and then the other 15 bits for the magnitude. Right? So what is that in hexadecimal? No one wants to answer that. No one, no one wants to take a guess at that on the chat. Okay, thanks. Okay. So at least one person is still listening. Um, yeah, so 8001. Um, all right, but anyway, yeah, you know, so make certain you keep, you, you apply that, right? So, so negative numbers need to be represented correctly and as hexadecimal. All numbers um, in your results for the, uh, that last problem for assignment three should be displayed as hexadecimal numbers um, um, in your system here, so. Um, One final thing on this. Um, so kind of like I said here, I mean, I I, I, I added in some like jump instructions. So um, it is possible if I only give you three instructions, um, if you don't hit a jump, um, you'll only have three fetch execute cycles before you get to a program counter 303. At that point, you don't know what the next instruction is, so you're done, okay? So if that ever happens, so if you ever get to your program counter to an address that you don't have um, given to you in the problem, um, you can stop, all right? 
but for um, if, if you have a jump instruction, it's possible that you have an that there'll be an infinite loop. So you could actually give me, you know, you could actually calculate forever or show me forever um, the, uh, the the result of doing. Uh, um, So, so, so yeah, I mean, if you have just, um, uh, if you don't have any jump instructions, um, you know, if you do three fetch executes, you should end up with a program counter 303, um, and there's no more to do at that point, right? But um, if you have a jump, um, you know, you, you could end up executing forever. So I said here that, that you don't have to do any more than six full fetch execute cycles. So, if you've done six fetch execute cycles, um, then then you can stop at that point. You don't, you don't have to go any further if you have if you're in an infinite loop. Um, how many problems here? All right, and then you know. So what I'm what I want is basically the same thing, but for the programs that I gave you for assignment three. So for example. Um, um, for this program, so for the initial state of memory here, the program counter is 300. So we're just going to, you know, the, the, the fetch stage should be trivial. Like I said, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically all you do on fetch is you dereference the program counter, fetch the contents of that memory into the instruction register. Right? And then on the execute stage is, is more complicated. Um, you have to decode the instruction that's in the instruction register. Um, make certain that you increment the program counter. So, so you should be showing the um, program counter uh, being incremented um, on the execute stage by one by default, unless it gets modified by a jump instruction. Okay. Uh, but, but yeah, you have to decode the instruction. So in this case, um, this is actually a load instruction, um, and this is loading from memory address 940. So. Um, so loads just basically transfer from the reference memory address into the accumulator. Okay. And, and then our next fetch, fetch execute cycle, you know, the program counter got incremented to 301. So now we're fetching instruction from 301 um, and executing that instruction, right? And so on. All right, so I gave you four of those with um, um, the initial contents of memory. This is the initial contents of the program counter, if it's not clear. So the program counter always starts at 300 for all these. Um, and then the accumulator starts at the value shown here. So the accumulator does differ between these different programs, uh, these different um, questions. All right, um, clear enough. Anybody have questions about the problem set three or the hypothetical machine? Um, Not, I mean, I think that um, I um, think that's good enough to for everybody to be able to understand the assignment three. Um, yes, yeah. So um, I think I've got a good recording. So somebody was asking about um, uploading. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to make certain that I always upload our class sessions to the D2L playlist. Uh, actually, to the YouTube playlist that you can access on D2L, so, um, barring technical difficulties, which I think I missed the first one, but uh, yeah. Um, all right, so maybe I'll, um, um, let me see, there's maybe one or two other things I can, um, let me see if there's anything that I might want to comment on other other things on 
for chapter three here. Um, so yeah, we already talked about, you know, this idea of the von Neumann architecture or the stored program computer. All right. I hope everybody understands. I mean, you know, in, in some sense, this is simple, but but if you if you internalize this, you, you understand um, some very basic things about how computers work. Okay, I mean, understanding the von Neumann architecture means that you understand um, why the fetch ex why this fetch execute cycle is the basic reason that things work. You know, because we have instructions and data in memory, and we're fetching the instructions from memory into the instruction register, decoding them, um, and executing them. Um, and those instructions have a memory um, um, part of the opcode is some sort of a direct or indirect uh, reference to memory so that we can reference uh, data items that we can use to operate on uh, by our instructions, right? Um, the von Neumann architecture implies that instruction and data both are in memory. So memory contains things that can be interpreted as instructions and thing, you know, cells or, or, or um, locations that can be interpreted as data. Um, it implies that memory is basically laid out like this as, a, as an array of fixed size words whatever the word size is, typically eight bits on a modern computer, 16 bits in our hypothetical machine here. So, I mean, you need to understand that, what, what the word size is, because that tells you the things about like how your instruction format is laid out, how your um, format for representing data types in memory, fundamental data types that your machine architecture instructions can interpret and operate on. And we're gonna have to have a layout um, Um, so yeah, data is interpreted by context. So again, I mean, any any location in memory, I mean, could it be interpreted as an instruction if you fetch it, if the program counter is pointing to it, you're gonna fetch it to the instruction register and try to interpret it as instruction or any location in memory could be interpreted as data. So if it's data, you're going to, the machine instructions are going to have some defined format, like the integer format. It's going to interpret it as that format. So the two basic formats um, are that there's there's a couple of different integer formats that most um, computer architectures support. There's floating point formats. Most computer architectures uh, support the IEEE floating point standard as a basic um, data type. Um, there, there's signed and unsigned integers. So there's a couple of different integer formats, like I talked about, and there's a couple of others. So there's basically a basic character type. So there's a, some instructions that can operate on characters interpreted as a uh, an ASCII character or, or as a Unicode as a, a Unicode character, um, and a few others. So. Execution is inherently sequential because the program counter is incremented by one. Uh, every fetch execute cycle. Um, but if that's all we had, we couldn't actually implement things like uh, loops and condition statements in higher level languages um, or functions, function calls. So there's there's branches there, there's branch instructions like jump, and there's also um, uh, control instructions for. Um, supporting function call or procedure call in implementations as well so to be able to implement writing functions um, in higher level languages and calling them and returning values from functions, that type of thing. So we'll talk about those. Um, later on in the course, we talked about the basic components of, of a computing system, so you should know that you know the computer basically at, at its most fundamental level has four subsystems the processor the memory io devices and some sort of interconnect mechanism so uh, it used to be a bus now it's a little bit more complicated but some sort of a interconnect point-to-point -point interconnect 
um, the fetch execute cycle um, that we've talked about here. Um, I should probably spend a little bit more time talking about some interrupts just for five minutes, maybe. Um, so, I mean, interrupts are necessary. Um, so I'll give you the most basic, uh, I think our textbook talks about this. So, so um, um, yeah, conceptually, again, this is another figure right from our textbook. So conceptually, you can think of modifying the fetch, ex fetch execute cycle um, by, uh, you know, in order to add in some interrupt processing. So maybe like at, at the end of, of um, uh, finishing the uh, decoding and the uh, execution of the instruction, we might check and see if an interrupt has occurred. And if an interrupt has occurred, um, um, we would process the interrupt. So interrupts were originally added to computing systems for efficiency or performance reasons, all right? So the most basic idea I can give you for these, uh, the textbook goes into more detail of these, um, is that, um, so, uh, very early on in computing operating systems, we're talking a little bit about operating system stuff here now for your operating system class. But one of the, the earliest fundamental advances in operating systems was to support what's known as multi-programming. So that's where you, instead of having just one program and executing it exclusively, you might have two programs in memory or more, right? So why would you ever do that? Well, because the problem was is that if you have one program, if that program is doing a lot of I.O., I.O. is typically much, much slower than, um, than running CPU instructions, so, so doing CPU calculations. So you might have to wait for, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of CPU cycle or, or clock cycles for an I.O. to complete, where all those clock cycles, if you were doing, could be, be done with, with CPU instructions, right? But anyway, I mean, IO, so IO is typically very inefficient. So the idea is that if I can have two programs, if one program needs to wait for a read to finish before it can start, before it can continue on working, I can switch to the other program and let the other program use the CPU and do some calculations while the IO is completing, okay? Um, So in order to do that, uh, we had to add in the idea of interrupts so that we could start the, um, um, the, the, the transaction on the interrupt device. So we could do, we could start the read on our, dry, on our disk drive. And then we would just let the disk drive work until it was done. And then we would leave it up to the disk drive to send an interrupt, which is just like a signal to the CPU. Um, when it's done. Um, so then, you know, if that interrupt occurs, the CPU knows the IO is done. Uh, it can go into an interrupt handler um, and finish up that, that IO and maybe switch back to the program that was waiting on that IO, for example. So that's one thing that might happen um, in the interrupt processing when, when you're finishing up some IO. Uh, but also the, the second uh, example I can give you for why interrupts are necessary um, is that modern computers, the, the von Neumann architecture, the, the stored program computers um, are um, kind of strange from the operating system's point of view in terms of being a control system, because basically, um, if you have an operating system controlling multiple programs, like, like we were just talking about, um, you only have one CPU. So basically what you do is you have to set the program counter to start executing instructions from the program. But at that point, the program effectively has control of the computer. And if that program um, doesn't do anything to give control back to the operating system code, um, that program would run forever, right? So um, in, in the earliest multi-programming systems that didn't have any mechanisms for regaining for the operating system regaining control, 
um, they left it up to the program. So when you switched into the program, it had to voluntarily do something to switch back to the operating system, to give it control back to the operating system, right? Uh, and again, this is kind of before interrupts as well here, right? So another major reason why we need interrupts is that is not um, a reliable mechanism. So, so um, if you rely on the, the programs functioning correctly, um, so, so, so they, it could be just because of a bug. So, so they might have a bug where they, they don't correctly give control back to the operating system. So call a function or return back to the operating system. Or they could be malicious. So they could, you know, so if, if, if I want to um, hog the computer, um, I might just continue doing all my calculations and never give control back to the operating system until I'm done with my work, right? Um, well, another major reason why interrupts are necessary is because we have to have um, what are known as timer interrupts. So, so our textbook talks about different kinds of, um, of interrupts. Um, um, I guess I don't have them in my notes here, but um, um, so basically uh, because of the, the issues that I'm talking about here, um, CPUs have to be designed to have two levels of instructions at least. So you have to have uh, you have to have um, privileged instruction modes. So some instructions that that um, are, are privileged um, or those are known as kernel instructions, and then you have to have regular instructions. So like user level instructions, right? And you have to have timer interrupts so that the operating system that that always runs in the more privileged mode before it ever gives control to a, a, a regular user program that can only run in regular mode, it can only run regular privileged instructions. But before it gives control to a regular user program, it sets a interrupt timer. Um, and when that interrupt timer occurs, um, that will automatically cause control to return back to the interrupt panel order, which is part of the operating system, right? So in that way, we can um, safely do multi-programming. So we can we can set it up, uh, set up um, a um, timer interrupt to occur, then jump to the program that we want to let run for a bit, and then even if that program is misbehaving um, or is never does I/O. So never gives explicit control back to the operating system. At some point, the interrupt will occur. The operating system will regain control, and then it can decide to, you know, maybe switch to another program, or let that program run some more. So switch back to that that program, or whatever it wants to do. Right. So um, anyway, I mean, interrupts are fundamental. Um, mechanisms for modern operating systems. They imply a bunch of things about computer architectures. Um, so you should understand kind of their basics and, and how they work. So. Um, and finally, I don't think I'll talk too much about, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, the whole last three sections um, were really about the, the, the interconnection structures. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's lots of details, and of course, you need to read this, um, and there'll be questions about this on our quizzes and our tests. Um, but um, yeah, as, as I said, you know, as I've already mentioned, you know, at their most basic, um, uh, the, the first kind of interconnection mechanism was a simple bus. So this is really, you know, kind of a glory, it was really just kind of wiring up. So this is just lay, laying down uh, a bunch of different. Uh, electrical wires between the different components. And, 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 you know, so it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's kind of really what the original system buses were. So, I mean, you've, you've, you've got to have multiple lines for the addresses and, and data transfer along the bus. And then there's going to be multiple, also multiple lines that are control lines. Um, and these, these are things, you know, so the, there'll just be a limited number of these, but by, by, for example, by setting the memory write control line to one, 
that indicates that something, you know, the CPU wants to do a write to memory. So when it does that, it, 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 it's signaling that it wants to control the bus. Uh, once it has control of the bus, then it can put uh, the address in memory that it wants to write to on the address lines. And it can put the data that it wants to write to on the data lines. Um, and then, you know, part of the clock cycles um, uh, for this bus would then cause that data to be available on the data lines um, and the, the, that would get transferred into the um, location indicated by the address on the address lines for that transfer, right? So, you know, so you have different things for read and write. So to get things from CPU to memory or from memory to CPU, likewise, you'd have maybe some control lines to get to and from IO devices. Um, and then you got other, the, these other things like acts and, and requests, acknowledges and requests are kind of part of the protocol. Okay, so these are a primitive form of a um, uh, of the protocol for accessing and transferring data over a primitive bus like this, right? Um, so modern computers, the, the bus has kind of evolved a bit. Um, a lot, most of this is, I mean, you know, except for in a course like this, um, if you're just using a computer or programming a computer, or even if you're um, writing like an operating system, so even down at that level, um, you really wouldn't know any of this kind of stuff. So all this stuff is down at the hardware level. So you wouldn't have direct access uh, even if you're writing operating system, code, maybe, maybe if you go down to like device driver, writing device drivers in the operating system, you might have to touch on some of these kinds of things at some point. But otherwise, you would never kind of see this. So, so this is all hidden down at, at the, the, the hardware level. So, so modern interconnects are kind of more complicated. Um, so there's, there's limitations. The book talks a little bit about them for a primitive bus. Um, for connecting up the components of the operating system. Um, so like I already mentioned, so these sort of point-to-point -point interconnects, um, I mean, I think of these, I'm, I'm, this is, again, this is probably oversimplifying, but I really think of these as, as the same as like a general networking protocol. So, so you're really defining like a, uh, like a software layer of, of stacks and you break it. So if I if I need to transfer something from the CPU to um, a memory, um, I'm going to have to go through these protocol layers. I'm going to break the request down into packets, um, which will get further broken down into the routing layer, the link layer, um, and then finally down to the physical layer, so that that gets presented down to the as actual physical uh, lines for this um, interconnect, um, um, and then there'll be things that can recognize that on the receiver that can bring the things back up through the um, um, this protocol stack um, um, and put those packets back together to deliver the, the, the data from the source to the destination, you know, like, again, like we're, if we're doing a read to memory or write to memory or read from memory or a, a write to an IO device or a read from it. Um, right. And then these are further complicated because we've got other kinds of, of things that are essentially uh, different kinds of buses like PCI, uh, but, but these peripheral buses are, are um, defined more for connecting in um, external cards, you know, so, so like a, the PCI uh, bus um, can be connected to the, 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 the interconnect bus, the QPI. Um, but then these then connect up so you can physically insert, you know, PCI cards, you know, so, you know, your, um, your GPU might be a PCI device or your network card. Um, um, if you don't have a, 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 if you don't have an on motherboard built in internet, you might plug in um, a, a network interface card, a NIC using PCI or so on. So PCI is, is a popular popular uh, bus standard for um, external um, 
card, external components, external I.O. devices, basically, right? But besides PCI, there's also USB. USB is another example. So most modern computers have both PCI and USB, and they'll also have um, often um, a um, um, hard drive, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, not SCSI, but um, um, there, there could be multiple of these. Um, and in a modern computer, you'll actually um, often have um, two or three of these as well for components, hard drives, uh, USB devices. So USB is another kind of peripheral standard. Um, that uh, we'll actually talk more about USB and PCI um, in a later chapter as well. So. But yeah, PCI works kind of in the same way, so uh, in a similar way. So it's really uh, kind of like a protocol stack where you've got transaction data link and physical layers, um, um, uh, and, and that defines a protocol for being able to, to transfer data um, over the PCI bus, right? All right. Um, there's a lot of details about about both of those um, that you should at least um, um, skim over. Make certain that that you get the kind of high level uh, picture of these things here. Um, Yeah, I didn't have as much to say in my notes about those. Um, I mean, you know, I, I think that um, I mean it's, it's useful, but but you know, you don't really have to understand the nitty gritty details. I think of, of these things um, as long as you as long as you kind of get the understand the broad strokes of of what's going on here um, and kind of how these work. Um, but kind of good enough for this class. So. Uh, all right. Um, I think that that's kind of all that um, that I wanted to say. Does anybody have any kind of final questions for me about the assignments or anything? Okay, um, well, if not, um, I'll go ahead and in the recording there. Um, like somebody asked, I'll, I'll, I'll post this. So I think I got everything here tonight, if you, if you want to review it. Um, yep, so let me know if you have questions about the assignment as you're working on it, assignment three or anything else. Um, and have a good night. I, I'll see you guys later then.